Today on What It's Like, 1957, Chrysler, Windsor, Town and Country Wagon. It's a very long name for a very rare wagon. Let's get into it. Before I get started on the 1957 Chrysler Windsor Town & Country review, huge thanks to Street Machinery, Hot Rods, and Classic Cars. They specialize in late 50s, early 60s Chevys, but they have other awesome cars in their inventory, just like this awesome 57 Chrysler wagon. If you're new to the channel, I'd like to invite you to hit that subscribe button. We do all things automotive. We might talk about a person in automotive history, we might do a really cool car. You never know what's coming on what it's like. Okay, on to the overview. Chrysler Town & Country story starts in the 40s. Forget everything you know about Town & Country. The original Town & Country was actually an eight-passenger woody wagon. They did offer a two-door version in 1946, Roadster model, convertible top, whatever you want to call it, woody wagon version. Awesome looking car. By the mid to late 50s, all the wood wooden body cars, for the most part, were phased out for all steel body construction wagons. You could still get wood paneling on doors, but gone were the days where the whole car, like the whole back portion of the car, or all the doors were made out of wood, and all the back pieces were made out of wood. Now they were all steel, for the most part. Bit of a side note, if you know me, I'm a huge 1950s car fan because a lot of innovation happened in the 50s. Every single year, car manufacturers came out with new cars, so 1955 Chrysler was totally different than a 1956 Chrysler in most cases. It seems like most companies today take the Porsche 911 approach and just produce the same car for the next 30 years, practically unchanged. Okay, we have to talk about this man. Man, myth, the legend, Virgil Exner. Ever heard of him? His title was Vice President of Design at Chrysler, and he's responsible for a whole bunch of cars. Here's a list of all the cars that he played a role in designing. Everything changed that moment our buddy Virgil laid eyes on that Lockhead P38 Lightning. From that moment forward, it was all about the fins, baby. He began an automotive movement from 1955 through 1963, deemed the forward look presented by Chrysler. Cars were longer, lower, wider, and looked sleeker than their predecessors. It's also important to note that Virgil wasn't the first one to put fins on an automobile, but that was Cadillac, but he made the fins what we remember them today. Last point I'm going to make on Virgil Exner. He was to Chrysler what Harley Earl was to GM. All right, well, getting back to this, 1957 Chrysler Windsor town and country wagon all right we're going to start back here and getting inside but there's a couple key features i want to point out before we get inside back here notice you've got some guards there's a guard there and there's a guard here to protect the chrome for whenever you put down this tailgate to get into the tailgate flip that up you can lock it but notice there isn't a handle to pull this down. You have to roll this window down first. Big window. And then once that is rolled all the way down, I'm going to bring you guys in closer so you can see better. Inside here, you have to pull up on it so it goes up over top of this little lip. And that is how the rear is released bringing you down low here so you can see where these bumper guards are so see how that rests on there like that so it doesn't scratch your chrome it's actually not that heavy the um, 56 Hudson cross-country Rambler wagon that I did earlier about a month ago it was a heavier tailgate than this but as you can see in the back here lots of space lots of storage space Underneath this door, you got, look at this. Look at this space you got. There's all kinds of extra tools, period correct. There's gloves. There's a nice full-size spare. That's a huge extra cargo space. Closing it. Same thing, just in reverse. It's a nice quality sound when you close it. And then you just crank the window back up. 
show you this. That's it. Your gas filler cap is right here on other Chryslers and it has a lock feature. Other Chryslers, it would be behind the uh, tail light. So I'm actually, I was really intrigued to find out that it was here instead of behind the tail light. But just take a look at that. Look at how that is styled. So coming back to the rear seat, I wanted to show you how you put this down. This front section has to, this bottom section has to roll forward. There's actually a little lever here. I'll bring you in so you can see it. There's a little lever here and you pull that up and that brings the whole seat forward. And then you can put this part of the seat. So when putting it down, there's a handle here. You can just push it and go all the way, fold all the way down. So that's what you're left with. So putting up the seats, the same thing, but in reverse, you just pull this up. Grab the handle here and just folds right back in there. See how these handles work? They they lift up. So there you got the door panel in the rear. This is your handle to get out. This is your window. The window goes the whole way down, which is very cool because a lot of cars from this era they didn't go all the way down. They kind of stopped right about there this is your door lock switch which i think is really cool because it doesn't look like it would be a door lock switch this is the back seat this seat's actually very comfortable Getting in the front, it's the same thing. I, I just love how these door handles, they go all the way up. I don't know if you can see that. We'll bring you closer. They pop all the way out. This is on the driver's door. You got a lot more going on. You have this handle here. What's that do? That that controls the spotlight that's on the other side, which was a option. You got your door handle, your windshield crank, vent window. That's the smallest little vent window I've ever seen. It's so cool. We're gonna give it a door close. That's the sound of quality. This is your spotlight. They put they used to put spotlights on cars for extra light. Now they just put spotlights on police cruisers, but back in the day you could get spotlights on any car. And it's controllable by the lever right here. You can move it, you can turn it any which way you want to turn it, you want to shine it at your friend over there. I get, I could see where this would be a problem. If you had like road rage or something, you could blind somebody with this thing. But that's, it's really cool to see it. The uh, mirrors are right here on the uh, fenders, not on the doors. This car has driver's side and passenger side mirror, which in the 50s was kind of a rare thing. Most people only had one mirror on the one side, but this got two mirrors. And you know, you have to adjust them out here. They don't have the adjustment feature inside yet. That hadn't come out yet. 
got a power antenna. There's a button inside where you can make the antenna go up or push the button and it go back down. It's also worth mentioning that because the door does not, because the door curves in here, it is so much easier getting into this car because you could put your foot where the wall would normally be or where the fender would normally be. So it's so much easier getting in and out. So look at how this pillar is. See how that's all hinged on there like that? And it just sounds so solid when you shut it. I love these fins. I just want to show you where this fin starts. It starts right here in the middle of the second door and it comes and then it gets bigger as it's coming back here towards this window. Just give you an idea. Look at that. Fifties cars are also cool because like, look at how this windshield is. People don't understand, there is no blind spots in vehicles like this because the A-pillar sits so far back. There's essentially no A-pillar. And because the windshield's curved, the door goes underneath the windshield and opens up like that. Check out this hinges, the way that they're shaped so that it, the door can open up like that. These door panels are of a really nice quality. They don't feel just like door cards. They feel very, it almost feels like leather. Let's walk you through this dashboard. We're gonna start with the, uh, one of the awesome things here. That is your transmission control. It is uh, push buttons. A lot of people think that push buttons are a new thing when in fact everything comes full circle eventually. Push buttons were 50s thing. Push buttons, you have neutral, drive, reverse, one and two. You could either get the uh, push button automatic or you could get a three speed manual. But we're gonna come down here first, over here. So these are your lights. That's how you turn your lights on. Notice the one, two switches move. It's kind of like an Edsel in ways. The high beam dimmer switch is on the floor where it should be over here this is your emergency brake so you pull it up like that to engage it down like that to put it back these are for your wipers and over here you have your blower and just like the uh just like the lights they move both of them move this one moves and this other one behind it moves one on the end is for your key goes in there. You put an aftermarket gauge in for your uh, temperature. This one's got air conditioning. That's your air conditioning unit. The uh, knobs control it. And these are your heater controls. Up here you have your radio. moving back over here you have your speedometer these gauges are absolutely gorgeous you have your clock and then you have your fuel oil amps and temperature and that one turn signals right here on the uh, column Just take a gander at that steering wheel look at how nice that looks it's gorgeous it's got this 
beautiful Chrysler logo deep inside the steering wheel. Check out this. Check out the map. There's no carpet in this car. It's underneath the mat. I lied. Got some carpet. Another cool feature that we didn't get to talk about. When you open that, the courtesy light is up underneath the dashboard, illuminating the dash, which is really cool. So here's your glove box. And inside, there's all these old uh, road maps. Be interesting to look that up and see how much things have changed. Notice the rear view mirror, it is on the dash. You got speaker here and you got some vents for uh for the defrost. But yeah, just look at that. Look at your visibility that you have. Let's talk about these headlights. So Prior to January 7th, 1957, this is a 57 model, but they would produce them in 56 and sell them as 57s. Just, just like now, you know, it's always a year into the future. So when this car was designed, quad headlamps hadn't been federally approved for, for sale on a vehicle yet. So a lot of cars you'll see have before January, you, you could either get the quad lamps or you could get the single lamps. But by January, they all went to quad lamps, except for the Chrysler 300. When the Chrysler 300 came out for the 57 model year, it had the quad lamps already installed. I love how these headlights sit back in here. It would be really interesting to see if, if this design, because they sit back inside, it's like almost they're sitting inside like a cave almost. I wonder if that helped it be any more brighter going down the road. Okay, so getting underneath the hood, they're all different, but most of them are in the middle here. It doesn't have a hood release inside. It's actually, you just find it, it just pops up. This hood's heavy. But it doesn't have any struts. It just has uh, like hinges that keep it. I don't know why they just don't go back to that. It's like spring style hinge type. All right, let's talk about this engine for a minute. It's a 354 cubic inch displacement V8 cast iron block, makes 285 horsepower, 4,600 RPMs, 365 foot pounds of torque. It was considered the polyhead V8. It is not the Hemi. You could get the Hemi if you stepped up to the New Yorker trim level. The New Yorker trim level offered a, a wagon as well, and they offered the 392 Hemi, making 325 horsepower, 430 foot-pounds of torque in a wagon in 1957. It's unreal. I want to, I want you to hear this thing shut. All right, so I want to show you these keys real quick. If, if you're looking at these keys and, and, and you're in the comment section, tell me in the comment section below if these are the actual keys to this car. I love the whole forward look that they put on there. That's really cool. And they have this uh, key keychain thing here. All right, to start it, you put the key in the ignition like we did. You turn the key to the right, put your foot on the brake, come over here and you push the neutral button. She comes to life. Sounds like a Hemi, but it's not a Hemi. So unfortunately today I didn't get to drive this one because it was sold and it was going to uh, Venezuela and they couldn't risk anything happening to the car, which I totally understand. Um, I'm so grateful that I was even given the opportunity to review a car such as this and give an in-depth tour. So if anybody is looking for a 1957 Chrysler wagon, this is what they could look for. Um, 
Some key specs that I forgot to mention, the original base price for this car was $3,264.1957. Chrysler made 2,035 of these total. They weighed 4,210 pounds, so that's two tons and then 210 pounds because there's 2,000 pounds in a ton. We already talked about the 354 cubic inch displacement V8 making 285 horsepower, which was a really healthy number in 1957. There was two trim levels that you could get. You could either get the Windsor, which was the base for the wagon, or you could step it up and get the New Yorker, which had pretty much every bell and whistle that you could possibly want. They only made 1,900 New Yorker wagons. But it's an awesome wagon that's getting harder to find, looks like nothing else on the road, has a lot of features, air conditioning, spotlights, cool fact of being a wagon. It was an awesome wagon and it was an awesome experience. And if you're looking for one, I'm going to put the uh, NADA classic car guide value at the end of this video so you can see what they're going for. So here's the NADA uh, classic car value. It shows you what the original MSRP is. It's different than what I found in my research. But um, anyway, why include this at all? Because a lot of times people don't know what to pay for a vehicle or if, if it's the flip side, they don't know what to sell a vehicle for. But a lot of times, like with the older stuff, it's it's worth what somebody will pay for it. But this is a good jumping off point, you know. It's always nice to know what your car's worth and I did do this for the very first video but for some reason I haven't done it and I'm going to keep doing it for every classic car I do the new ones obviously can't put values on those because the dealers do that yeah so thank you guys so much for watching I I really enjoyed this one and it really means a lot to me um with all your support and likes and comments and stuff so Give this video a like if you like it, and give me a comment. What what could I have done better? What did I get wrong? And uh, until next time, toodaloo!